Uh, okay, this is the uh, final technical session for this afternoon. And uh, there are uh, four presentations again lined up. Uh, we have to finish on time. So therefore I request all the presenters to be stick to the times given. Uh, so I'd like to call uh, all four presenters to, presenters to the head table. Uh, I heard that uh, two of uh, the presenters are actually uh, connected online. So whoever the presenters here, uh, please uh, come to the head, head table. So I'll call upon uh, all four presentation, presenters. Uh, DMNCT Disanayaka, CP Ranavaka, UM uh, Samara Ratna, and JM Moja Ratna. So please uh, come to the head table. Uh, very first presentation uh, of this uh, session is uh, from uh, CP uh, Disanayaka. It's about the study on development and implementation of safety inspection drones with machine learning algorithms to improve the construction safety in Sri Lanka. I give a brief uh, profile of uh, DMNCT Disanayaka. It's a graduate uh, continuity survey from the General Sir John Kotalal Defense University in 2020. Now working as a proficient continuity surveyor in Sri Lanka, his research interests include modern construction method, building information modeling, construction safety and construction project management, uh, areas pertinent to the uh, tertiary education. So I uh, invite Mr. Disan to make his uh, presentation. Thank you, doctor. I think you can hear me. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, okay. Let me begin then. Uh, you might be wondering why these drones on construction related research. Well, uh, the last year when I was at uh, industrial training, one major thing I have noticed that the safety of construction sites are pretty poor and questionable. Are there policies and procedures enough to protect construction personal lives? My dear sir, madam, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Nadira Disanayak, an undergraduate continuity survey from General Sir John Kotlao Defense University. And my research emphasizes an automated safety inspection drone. It has its own algorithm to analyze and detect safety hazards on construction grounds. These hazards include smoke detection, fire detection, and absence of personal protective equipment. All right, that was simple overview to my study, but I'm going to present in the next few minutes. Have you ever seen that uh, there is a common notice when we entered into a typical construction site uh, banner showing? safety first do you think uh, the safety actually become number one in here unfortunately it's not due to the uh, profit driven industry safety has become the secondary concern the department of labor mentioned that uh, annually 500000 man days are wasted due to occupational health issues and a study found that only 42% of uh, construction sites are able to employ a suitable safety officer in sri lanka Basically, uh, the safety officers' decisions based on observations gathered from frequent walks in the site. Well, uh, no wonder that uh, these traditional methods are time consuming, less effective, less efficient when it's come to large scale projects. All right, in here, we focus on how to overcome them by blending deep learning algorithms with drones to improve construction safety in sites. Next, we come into the uh, specific problem caused uh, this study. The problem behind this was the uh, rising of accidents in construction sites in past few years in Sri Lanka. There are three factors related to Sri Lanka that I have identified when I was going through the uh, past literature. First one is a uh, lack of qualified safety officers, uh, second lack of uh, technology, and finally the economical problems. In 2015, uh, Lee identified six research area uh, should pay more attention to improve the safety on sites, which includes uh, lack of unsafe uh, behavior monitoring, lack of innovative technology application in construction sites. Therefore, I'm going to demonstrate here how to enhance current safety inspection methods using technology at a minimum cost to uh, match the requirements of Sri Lanka. 
All right, uh, the study uh, going through two objectives. Uh, first one is develop an acceptable algorithm with the drone to analyze the current situation in job site and detect safety hazards. In this step, I have uh, used an open source Python code to develop, the, develop and match the requirements of my study. In the second step, I have used an, uh, uh, I, I did a perform a case study with the experimental analysis by inspecting real-time video from a job site to measure the accuracy of the algorithm. Uh, the study built upon the past uh, valuable findings. I structured it throughout the following topics, construction, safety, unpredictability, manual inspection methods, drone usage in construction, deep learning algorithms, and automated inspection methods. So basically the past studies, I'm talking about the last topic, uh, the automated inspection methods, most of them are out of uh, construction industry. Some are, some are on construction, but they don't uh, directly use on safety officers inspection methods, and none of them are using drones. So I'm going to fill up that gap using my research. Well, uh, the main component of the system is uh, the image processing algorithm. The specific algorithm is written on Python programming language, and it's open source and freely available under GNU license 3.0 in github.com. So I used that for my hazard detection requirements in here. Moreover, we have to uh, deal, uh, moreover, the development of open source uh, Python code was going through uh, six steps under gathering data. I made a photo archive, including photos of construction personal protective equipment, photos of fire and smoke. After that, uh, the second step to the third step all include the programming part, and I'm not going to demonstrate that part in here. And the fourth step, we train our data set, basically including the photos of uh, photo archive that I prepared on the first step. Plus, uh, this model consumed nearly seven hours to train three objects with 100 epochs. Okay, the epochs mean uh, one cycle of uh, entire data set that the machine learning algorithm has been through. And a training a data set usually takes more than one epoch. Uh, increasing epoch size can increase accuracy up to a specific level, but uh, beyond a certain point that I'm going to discuss on discussion part that you can see our data model tend to of it. In the final step of our first objective, I tested this algorithm with real photos I have taken from construction site. I will be more described on that discussion part. And the other section is the measuring of accuracy of hazard detection, which emphasize our second objective as well. The F-score was the main method that we used to test our hazard detection and abilities of the algorithm. If I give a brief overview, the F-score is the harmonic mean of a specific algorithm and it's numeric result value between zero and one. The F-score consists with uh, precision and recall values. The precision also known as positive predictive value. And it's the fraction of true positive cases among the combination of true positive and negative cases. Recall also known as sensitivity. And this is the fraction of true positive among the combination of true positive and false negative. Using them, we can calculate EBSCO as the formula mentioned on the screen. Uh, moreover, we have to collect video data to analyze our system. So video data was uh, collected through a assembled drone, which has a camera mounted and it's capable to transmit video signals over Wi-Fi network. Uh, okay, let's uh, see our results here. As mentioned, the epochs versus accuracy graph observation provide me the details how our data model was trained and how much accuracy gained throughout the train cycles. Uh, this model consumed nearly about seven hours to train three objects with 100 cycles. After the 100 cycle, the model uh, tend to off it and accuracy become decreased that uh, you can see that on our graph. So after the 100 cycle, the model training was stopped and finally our model gained over 70% accuracy. So that's how I checked the quality of the algorithm and exported that data for further usage. To fulfill the other half of the objective one, a virtual test has been carried out to examine how this algorithm interact with real data from a construction site. In this segment, uh, we collect some real photographs of construction personnel with hard hats. And altogether, the algorithm detects them with more than 80% of accuracy. 
before I move on to the uh, second objective results, I'm going to describe how the system actually works and how it sends uh, the safety hazards. In step one, uh, the ground station, the computer installed software called Autopilot that will send the coordinates to the drone uh, to fly and analyze for hazards. And uh, then the drone will send video data real time to the ground station, which has the algorithm, and it will be analyzing for safety hazards, including absence of personal protective equipment uh, and smoke and fire. If any hazard detects, it will send alert to safety officers. The alert sending mechanism is still under development. So instead of that, we need a person to communicate with safety officer at this stage to inform about hazard, identify the algorithm. Okay, let's move to the second objective results. Uh, the objective two contains three accuracy examines, which are in all in the case study. First one is the smoke detection accuracy test. Uh, the data chart, what I used for analyze purpose contains drone data means uh, count taken by drone, manual data means count taken by a safety officer. Uh, in here, we have to keep in the mind manual data always 100% true because we have to compare the drone detection with true data. And let's see how we did the case study. Uh, in an area of 200 square meters within the construction site, uh, we made uh, smoke emitting points with a uh, maximum of six smoke points and minimum of zero. And we sent the drone to analyze the specific site. And in this case, the manual count is 100% accurate. And the drone count most of the time uh, equals to manual count. So sometimes exceed or less than the right count. For example, in the data chart, let's take uh, test number two, the safety officer manually counted three smoke points. It's 100% uh, accurate and drone count is also three. If we compare both the accuracy of the drone is 100%. If we take test number three, the manual count is four smoke points, but the drone only able to count three smoke points. So in this case, there's a true positive value equals to three means accurate counts. And also false negative value equals to one count means data which missed. Uh, similarly in the test number five, manual count is five and drone count is six. That means one additional smoke point counted by the drone. So it has false positive value equals one means data additionally counted, but uh, they do not exist on the field. Okay, finally using those values, we can easily calculate precision and recall then the F score. Uh, the remaining fire detection accurate test and the PP detection accurate test are performed uh, same as the pre previous smoke test and end of every test the F score was calculated as before. And finally, uh, calculate the mean value for all three F scores and all three accurate tests were scored about 90% of uh, good accuracy by proving drone has a better accuracy of hazard detection while fulfilling the second objective of the study. Well, uh, we reached to the uh, conclusion of the results. In this initial state, we had a satisfactory training accuracy for algorithm and it exceeds 70% of training success. And next thing was the virtual test to measure how it fits with the real world data. When we feed data to the algorithm, it's able to identify them and response with over 80% of good accuracy. For, so uh, with this uh, positive feedback, we move to the next objective. In this phase, a case study has been done on a construction site near Columbia area. For this, three examines has, have been done, as I mentioned before. And overall, 90% of F score accuracy gain by proving this system is reliable and have accuracy to perform hazard detection with real world situation. Well, uh, that's the end of uh, my work here. And uh, these are some future research directions I need to mention. We can develop the algorithm and drone hardware to detect body temperature of construction personnel. Uh, this could be helpful on pandemic situations like COVID-19. Uh, not only that, we can identify unusual behaviors like disputes, uh, suicidal behaviors, drug usage with more complex algorithms. And finally, I can suggest that developing drones for safety inspection in underground constructions and integrating algorithms with CCTV systems can enhance the safety inspection inside mines and uh, inside buildings. All right, uh, that brings us to the end of the presentation. At the end of the day, uh, the goals are very simple, safety and security. Thank you everyone who supported me on this study and thank you so much for your interest and kind attention. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sana. It's a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. So I think we are discussing about the uh, the real requirement of uh, what is called technology. Uh, even during this uh, pandemic situation, we have encountered the, the requirement. So I think this has a good future. Hopefully, as you said, uh, this can be extended for the to identify the COVID uh, impact. Uh, sorry, infected uh, maybe employees or uh, that sort of a things in the construction, even some other sectors as well. So we'll be uh, taking your questions uh, uh, from the audience at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Right. Uh, so we'll be heading to the next uh, presenter. Uh, that is uh, Mr. C. P. Ranavaka. Uh, he's presenting. Uh, on uh, an analysis of uh, professional participation of registered license surveyors in land uh, partition. Let me give a brief introduction about Mr. Pakirana. Uh, it's a planner, actually. Uh, planner Poojit Ranavaka. Sorry, it's not Pakirana, it's Ranavaka. Senior lecturer at the Department of Spatial Science, Faculty of Built Environment and Spatial Sciences. General Surgeon, Kotalawala Defense University. His research interest uh, mainly on land administration, management, land uh, partition and subdivision and spatial planning. So I'll uh, invite uh, Mr. C.P. Ranavaka to do his uh, presentation. Mr. Anavaka, we can't hear you. Yes. Okay, am I out of yes, you? Yes. Please, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. I'm CP Ranavaka from the Department of Special Sciences. Uh, this analysis, I'm going to analyze an analysis of professional participation of registered license surveyors in land partition in Sri Lanka. Actually, in Sri Lanka, we are having very limited urban lands, mainly dominated by the private sector. These lands are governed by the, administered by the Partition Act of Sri Lanka. Uh, statistical analysis says there are a large number of court cases due to the partition cases. It is said more than 200,000 200, in district courts actually and several other courses are like that. This is a burning issue because uh, land managers and other parties want to put in these land into the uh, effective investment in the urban context. Main root cause of this situation is deed registration of private lands started in 1863 and is still in use. Therefore academics on land administration highlight the need of immediate actions to be taken for the minimum of this problem. So this problem is number of partition cases over the ownership of the ownership districts on private lands are being increased and they are the longest running cases in the courts of Sri Lanka. This situation is adversely affected to the better administration and management of those very limited private urban lands which are having enormous development potentials. Partition Act is the one of the tools to partition of those private lands. The effectiveness of the Partition Act and level of contribution of the registered license surveyors to expedite partition surveys has not been studied. When we browse the literature relating to the partition, actually it has a global meaning to local meaning. When it comes to, uh, in between countries, international level, diplomatic level, when it, it comes to the country, it's national level, within the country, regional level and uh, district level, it's administrative level, when it comes to the political level, it is electorate, 
when it comes to the GN division level, it is socio-economic boundaries. When it comes to the partition level, it is neighborhood boundaries. Therefore, this area has much bigger area. Partitioning refers to the situation where land is with co-ownership. It's transferred with one or more other co-owners in land. The legal meaning of the term partition is not just subdivision. When partition case start, interlocutory write the case. Partition has two brain branches. Partition kind means physical partition. Partition by cell means selling. Physical partition also voluntary partition and compulsory partition. Selling also voluntary sell and forced sell. Selling also public and private selling. The uh, license service involved with this area is very limited part, uh, professionals in, here in Sri Lanka. To be a qualified person is very difficult because of the strong academic background in related to the surveying, registration with regulated body, and having membership with the institute is very difficult. And court commission has critically identified task in the court, identify the land, identify the all other relevant parties outside of the land, determine the partition by cell or partition by kind, and recommend to the court preparing of the preparation of the partition proposal in all aspects of each and every portion and overall payment and getting consent all the parties and defending the case at the middle of two parties or several parties and submission properly. Appraisal is also very difficult. Therefore, we have to uh, register license has to consider soil, improvement, plantations, interest thereon. Therefore, in some countries, those are done by separate uninterested parties. Here in Sri Lanka, it is done by registered license himself. And party pl planning control is very crucial because of the uh, uh, willingness of the two parties and the understanding of the judges. Regulation covers social, economical, physical and environmental aspects, but under the interlocutory decree concerns only legal aspect. Adop uh, adoption of the court, co court automation is crucial situation because now in partition case we have to submit dossier of documents through the manual submission. It is to be uh, submitted by the digital mode but here in Sri Lanka still that automation is being implemented. Therefore, registered license surveys are need to adopt use of ICT, digitization, internet of things and web, uh, web access also. Metally, we selected one province called Sabragam and one district called Kagal. And we selected 25 registered license surveys for this analysis and forwarded uh, 22 direct questions and 73 opinion survey about identified phenomena. The analysis did not uh, continue after the statistical uh, analysis, mostly related sections of partition act to the commissioner were evaluated in terms of selected criteria like that prepared partition plan also evaluated to the selected criteria. Analysis reveals that partition and land cases account for 8% of total court cases and uh, they are the longest running cases in the court. Nearly more than 4, 40,000 land and partition cases are there still in Sri Lanka and some of them are more than 5, five years of time running and some of the cases are running more than 10 years of time. This is a burning issue in the society. When we consider the participation of registered license surveys, there are only 32 registered license surveys as court commissioners in Sabaragamu province for eight courts. Almost 45% of them decided not to involve with the court commission surveys due to various reasons. 41% of them in Kegol district rejected to court commission surveys. Out of those 32 registered license surveys, Sabaragamu province, 60% of them are more than 70 years of age. During the last 10 years, six surveyors have joined with the court cases while five surveyors have left. Due to this reason, we have to uh, 
consider some other province also here in Sri Lanka. We selected southern province. There are 69 registered license surveys, or 10 courts. Almost 20 registered license surveys in province have decided not to involve in the court cases due to the various reasons. In Matra district, this, this situation is 45%. There are only 6 registered license surveys for court commission in Hambantar district. This is a burning issue to this district. Therefore, among these 69 surveys, 73% of the surveys are over than 70 years of age. When we consider their uh, experiences, they are having more than 30 years of experiences and 92% of are having diplomas. One is having, uh, one is a graduate and one is having postgraduate. This, um, this says uh, there are no young graduates still to be court commissioning. And when we consider adoption of digital data, 88% is being adopting while 12 is remaining in analog mode. When we consider documentation and submissions, 64% are in CAD environment and digital mode, 36% is in transition period. When we consider the planning concerns, when we putting in this land into the investment, planning consideration is very requirement. The consideration of planning, 28% only think regarding the planning considerations. Like that, applicability of new technology, 36% of registered license surveyors at the middle of technological transformation in various stages. 40% of the registered license surveyors hesitate to use online apps and CAD operations. Only 5% know about the ongoing uh, court automation program in the court. And using website for uh, information, only doing 20%. When we uh, survey the attitude towards the court commission, 35% of, of them think that act doesn't provide enough uh, facilities. And 50% of them think that court commissioning is an extra burden to their freelance practitioning. And 70% of them think that professional recognition at the court when they're defending their uh, subdivision is very crucial and 95% of them says cross-questioning and argument with lawyers are very uh, crucial. When we consider the attitude towards the Partition Act, they say uh, pro uh, provisions provided for oval calculation is very crucial. Some of them says uh, section 16.3 notice is very important. And 70% of them say identifying subject to object is very salient feature of the court commission act. When 30% uh, says payment system for the survey fee is non-formal, while 95% of them says security provided at the field when they execute the court commission is not like that. When we uh, browse the completed survey plans, 95% of them are having regulatory acceptance and next is uh, circular errors within the subdivision and mobility issues, accessibility issues and physical dimensions required by the planning agencies are also highlighted. When we check the, the situation with manually prepared plans and the computer aided prepared plans, we can clearly see that when they turn to the computer aided environment, they could manage the reduce the issues regarding the uh, those regulatory issues. And still we can see three steps of plans. Totally manual prepared plans, semi-manual prepared plans and fully computer-aided plans. There are uh, some kind of examples, fully manually prepared plans and semi-manually prepared plans and finally computer-aided plans with uh, application of all planning environmental regulations. This is the situation where we expected in court commissions also. The conclusion is joining of the new registered license surveys with the court commission surveys remain stopped. Most of them view that involvement of court commission surveys are extra burden to their professional life. There is a clear threat of conducting court commission surveys in future. Issues with the professional registration, 
issues with the non-formal payment recovery system, issues with the professional recognition at the court, and poor facility as the court of, for survey works uh, discourage new joining with the court commissions due to poor cash for due to poor cash flow of the uh, recovery methods the registered license service have not been fully committed to court commission surveys while practicing as freelance practitioner they involved in court commission surveys as well as average court commission survey completion rate is two per month therefore partition cases have been piling up in the court continuously majority of the registered license surveys who are in the practice are elder than 70 years of age while there are no way for young graduate to join with the court due to the delay of introducing methodology of obtaining practice right this will be a burning issue in sri lanka majority of the registered license surveys have not been fully adapted to the digital environment and technically transformation therefore strategies need to be considered to adopt those professionals into the court of formation program going to be implemented the overall calculation and justifying appraisal values for portions becoming crucial due to lack of academic background related to the land valuation appraisals this vital responsibility is conducted by the registered license service at the middle of pressure of plaintiff defendant and lawyers in the absence of arbitrators thank you very much taken in a uh, right uh, country scale and address this issue anyway you go to the uh, questions uh, in the question and answer session but uh, i realize there's a real gravity on this matter uh, right uh, there's a general right norm that uh, we said uh, uh, the land cases are lifetime right so <laughs> as you correctly said it's going to be true uh, uh, it's going to be proven. So thank you very much. Uh, and we'll, I'll invite uh, next presenter, uh, UM uh, Samara Ratna. I think Miss uh, Samara Ratna is, I think, she's here. Uh, her topic is uh, addressing barriers to integrate social sustainability in construction industry. Which is again a very interesting uh, topic. So let me give a brief uh, uh, profile of uh, Miss uh, Samara Ratna. She is instructor attached to the Department of Country Serving of the Faculty of Built Environment, Spatial Sciences, General Sir John Kotalawal at Defense University. She holds a BSc Honors Content Survey from the University of Salford. Her research interests include sustainability, construction, project management, and green building technology. So I invite her to do her presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Umesha Samar from Department of Quantity Surveying, General Sir John Patalala Defense University. I'm going to present my research titled as Addressing Barriers to Integrate Social Sustainability in Construction Industries. Table of Contents. First, the background, then the problem statement, purpose statement, methodology, research, uh, results and finding, conclusion or recommendation, finally, the references for further study. Background of the research. Uh, the, the interrelation and balance of the economic, environmental and social aspects are key areas in sustainable development. This sustainability approach has prompted as initiative in construction sector to address economical and environmental concerns by reducing waste and energy consumption, as well as improving end user satisfaction and protection of the environment. But for a truly successful sustainable construction project, must consider social aspects as the project impact on the sur uh, surrounding society, 
as well as the safety, healthcare, and education of the workers. By implementing these elements, we will expand the project's continuing effective, effectiveness and also the well being for those who are impacted. Further, uh, since there has been an increasing awareness that the construction industry must support the sustainable development by including uh, social considerations throughout the construction project. So, uh, social sustainability can be defined as the engagement among employees, local community, clients, and the supply chain to ensure the meeting, uh, meeting the needs of current and future populations and communities. Safe and healthy living and working conditions are important components of social sustainability, along with the impact of the project on the local community towards its life cycle. The problem, uh, problem statement, uh, the social, environmental, and economical scopes of sustainability are all influenced considerably by construction projects. Uh, regardless of the fact that there are significant literature on the economical and environmental sustainability, a little was done to investigate social sustainability in construction industry. So, uh, so in light of this, the goal uh, of this research is to look at the major barriers to adopt social sustainability in Sri Lankan construction industry. The purpose of this uh, research is to improve the social sustainability in, uh, in Sri Lankan construction industry. To achieve that, the social sustainability has defined from the view of construction industry and identified the major barriers to integrate social sustainability in construction industry. And the findings of this study may not include the information that, uh, that about the barriers to social sustainability but also to expand the social sustainability practices in Sri Lankan construction industry. Uh, for the methodology uh, of this research, uh, two journals, conference uh, papers, books, and dissertations, a comprehensive analysis of the literature was conducted and uh, recognized the idea of social sustainability within the construction industry and also to explore the major barriers associated with adopting social sustainable practices in construction sector. Then to achieve the research goals, any structured interviews with any experts in the field were used as data collecting methods, and the data was examined using content analysis as the method of data analysis. For the methodology, uh, methodology the, first, uh, the first step was to do a background study, then the research problem was identified and a comprehensive literature was done. So a qualitative research approach, uh, data was collected in some structured interviews and through a continue, content analysis, data was analysis and the conclusion are, and the aim of this research was achieved. For the results and findings, uh, three major barriers were identified to increase in, to integrate social sustainability in construction industry. The, uh, the uh, first major barrier was lack of awareness of the concept. We all know uh, when we talk about the sustainability, uh, mainly we talk about the economical and environmental sustainability. So uh, uh, that is because the ignorance or misinterpretation of the impress, uh, impression of social sustainability. Uh, uh, social sustainability is uh, often misunderstood due to the deficiency of knowledge regarding the subject. Social sustainability can't be accomplished without expertise or awareness of the experts, given the complex, dynamic, uh, and difficult characteristics of the construction project. The second major barrier was lack of government support. Accomplishment of socially sustainable construction industries depending on good government procedures and assistance, which would prevent the process if not provided. The lack of sustainability related building regulations, deficiency of government initiates, and absence of legislation are all major barriers to achieve social sustainability in construction. The government's commitment, policies, assistance, and the development of legis legislation are crucial to the accomplishment of social sustainability in construction. 
The third main variables, stakeholders, conflicts of interest, and divergent points of view. Divergent uh, uh, perspectives and conflicts of interest among stakeholders are a primary reason of uh, inadequate practices in social sustainability, and this has prompted concerns about the efficiency in achieving long-term growth of social sustainability. Because every stakeholder does have a personal interest within a project, and this can lead to divergent priorities, disputes, and substantial ri uh, rise in the situation's complexities. This is the most critical barrier as a construction project cannot be carried out sustainably without the complete backing of the client, contractor, and other stakeholders for socially sustainable principles. And for the conclusions and recommendations, social sustainability has lately garnered a lot of attention from across the world in order to adopt sustainability in the construction sector. Meanwhile, the nations like Sri Lanka, the discipline of social sustainability still in its infancy and confronts significant challenges and barriers. These barriers must be overcome in order to develop successful and widespread social sustainability practices in building industry. To that end, the goal of this research was to look at the barriers to social sustainability. Lack of understanding in the concept of social sustainability, lack of government support and stakeholders' conflicts of interest and diversion points of view were identified as the key barriers to based on the findings. To attain the objective of social sustainability, it was recommended consideration of a company's responsibility towards all stakeholders who are impacted by the construction project is a social responsibility that an organization should adopt in order to enhance the social sustainability in construction industry. Protecting and promoting well-being through, uh, through a healthy and safe working environment to reduce construction worker injuries and fatalities, as well as the increasing construction worker health. Another effective way of ensuring social sustainability is through integration, transparency, accessibility, and collaborative le uh, learning among the various stakeholders in the project. Constitutional or structural political transformation is necessary to enhance the quality in construction industry. And the study plays the way uh, for future research as developing initiatives to improve social sustainability in Sri Lankan construction industry. Uh, this reference can be used to uh, study this area further. And thank you. And, uh, and uh, I pay my sincere gratitude to the Faculty of Building Environment and Spatial Sciences of Gerald Sojourn Kotalal Defense University. And also my co-authors, Dr. S.P. Jai Surya and Mr. A.R. Kiamutunga, and all the industrial experts who participated for the interviews. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a very important area. It has been discussed uh, for last uh, even more than a decade to incorporate this uh, social sustainability to construction industry. So I know personally because it's in 2017, uh, I participated, uh, uh, it's in 2016, I participated uh, uh, one uh, advisory panel uh, to uh, in incorporate the social sustainability to the green uh, accreditation systems. I think uh, still it's not uh, much uh, what is called focused, but uh, as you correctly said, uh, we need more uh, attention into this one because uh, the, the environmental and economic uh, aspects are already being uh, mostly discussed, right? But this area is still a bit of a gray area because some, some people, the definition of social sustainability itself is a bit uh, vague and not uh, being uh, agreed upon, mainly that is the issue. So we'll uh, discuss that one in the Q&A session. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Number uh, four, uh, the last presentation for the day is from, uh, so she has indicated uh, very correctly as Miss, so there's opportunity for other people, uh, youngsters here. So M.O. Jayaratna, 
uh, uh, going to present uh, her paper on mitigating the effects of e-learning in higher education sector in Sri Lanka during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So let me give a brief introduction to uh, Ms. Jayamana. Uh, Jayamana uh, is a graduate uh, in uh, Bachelor of Science, uh, serving science degree, first class from General Sir John Kutalawal in Defense Industry 2019. She is currently employed as a lecturer, professionally at the Faculty of Built Environment and Spatial Sciences uh, in the Sir John, John Kutalawal Defense University. Her research interests are mainly on surveying and civil engineering, where she attempts to incorporate and optimize the modern surveying techniques in surveying and construction industry uh, related things. She is also engaged in multidisciplinary research areas pertaining to the tertiary education. So we'll uh, invite uh, Ms. Jayaman to make her presentation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Moshibu Jamana from the Faculty of Great Environment and Spatial Sciences. So our study today concentrates on mitigating the effects of learning in the higher education sector in Sri Lanka, with special reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. My presentation for today spans across several topics as depicted on the screen. So I'm moving on to the introduction. At the time of speaking, we are facing a major health crisis in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic. And almost all the service sectors, including the higher education, are on a standstill. More specifically, the major state universities in Sri Lanka have been closed down for months. And according to UNESCO, around 158 nations are severely affected through this condition. And in terms of education, more than 1.2 billion, or more than 70% of the total registered learners, have been severely impacted to this condition. This situation has led almost all the countries, including Sri Lanka, to move to the online education systems. So this study was uh, set out to examine the problems ignited in this sudden shift, so that we could understand our problem. That was the shifting to this online education has ignited challenges for the learners as well as academics. So in the higher education sector in Sri Lanka, and it has raised concerns about the effectiveness of the pedagogy, the delivery of the learning content, and the realization of the ultimate learning outcomes. Thus, the ultimate objective of this study was to uh, examine the challenges entitled in the online education in the Sri Lankan higher education sector, and was generated with a view to propose some mitigating measures to overcome these challenges successfully. E-learning is not something that has emerged only during this COVID-19 pandemic. Over the years, it has been considered as an effective way uh, to deliver the instructional content. So you can see on the screen, uh, there are many global and local literature, and many scholars have found out how effective the e-learning sessions are. Also, you can see many scholars have found out the factors effective uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of e-learning sessions. So basically, this uh, we have conducted a comprehensive literature survey, and uh, the factors, predefined factors, actually was used for uh, our data collection and uh, analysis. With that, I can move on to the methodological design of my study. As I was explained earlier, also we did a very comprehensive literature survey, whereby we uh, we used a lot of global and local literature, and we found out some predefined factors that are said to be effective to the learning process. And those factors were benchmarked, and the questionnaire was developed, and it was circulated among the undergraduates of Sri Lankan higher education sector. Specifically, we choose a random sample of 350 undergraduates from nine local, state, and private universities. The responses were then taken and was uh, Analyze in order to get a final descriptive analysis. Let me introduce the results of my study. First of all, the factors affecting the effectiveness of e learning. As I mentioned earlier, this was taken through a comprehensive literature survey. More specifically, according to the International Association of Universities, they have stated in their global survey report on the impact of COVID 19 on the higher education around the world. They have identified three factors or three variables that are said to be most uh, 
efficiency for the efficiency of learning sessions. The first one is the accessibility to the technological infrastructure. Second one is the distance learning competencies and the psychological concerns of the students. Third one is the field of study. So this study was benchmarked using these three factors and the results hereafter are based on these three found variables. Moving on to the first one, the accessibility to the technological infrastructure. In the global perspective, the International Association of Universities have found out three countries, three types of countries based on the accessibility to the technological infrastructure. First group is the countries for which shifting to this online education is extremely unrealistic because the students do not have the necessary technological infrastructure. Second group is the countries that are having no issue in shifting to the online education system because they have a proper internet connection and necessary technological infrastructure. Third, and the most common group is the countries which are having a partition between the students, those who are having the necessary infrastructure and those who do not. So undoubtedly, Sri Lanka falls under this category. And being in that category, we ask the perspective of the students. So we ask the students regarding what technological device that we use for the online learning sessions. So you can see in the figure, 46.8% of the students stated that they use the laptop all the time. Whereas a closely equal amount, 43.1% has stated that they use the mobile phone for all their academic work. So as academics, we should consider how effective using mobile phone for all the academic work. Then, uh, only 9% of the students have stated that they will use the device depending upon the situation. So once the situation, once the situation is being asked from them, only 37.8% stated that that is depending upon the type of activity or the module, whereas 62.2% stated that that is based on the network coverage that they have. So with that, we can understand that network coverage is a crucial issue in Sri Lanka. So again, in order to get the student's perspective, we asked about the problems that they have faced during the online learning sessions and online examinations. So you can see, in online learning sessions, 59.6% of the students have stated that the most prominent issue that they have faced during online lecture sessions is not having a satisfactory internet connection. At the same time, 12.6% have stated that they did not have necessary technological infrastructure to attend to the lectures. Also regarding the online examinations, the students have claimed that, actually 48.3% have claimed that they could underperform than expected using uh, online, uh, online examinations just because they did not have the satisfactory internet connection. Also, 18.9% have stated that they did not have the necessary technological infrastructure to attend to the online examinations. With that, we can again understand that the technological infrastructure is a crucial factor for Sri Lankan undergraduates. Then we are going to move to the uh, distance learning competencies and the psychological concerns of the students. We all know almost every student, almost every one of us is facing a hard time here, and the students are not at all in an academic environment. They are at their homes struggling to study. So we asked about their worries and their psychological distress regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. We asked that in a Likert scale of one to five, where five indicated the maximum stress. So you can see the students have responded with a mean value of 4.42. Also, the other descriptive statistics are shown in the screen. You can see out of the 250 undergraduates, 221 has stated that they have a maximum level of stress. Also, for a more competency analysis, let's check the students' perspective regarding the problems. So here again, 12.6% of the students, that is the amount that a lot of the students are already did not have the necessary technological infrastructure. The same amount of students has stated that they could not attentively engage in the lectures because of the stress associated with the COVID-19. Also, 7.9% of the students claim that they could not perform well in the online examinations in this condition due to the stress associated to them or their family members during this COVID-19 pandemic. With that, I'm moving on to the third category, or in my perspective, which I believe is the most important category here, the field of study. So the, our sample of students have comprised in the fields of biology, chemistry, engineering, and survey, keywords, architecture, arts, and IT. 
So we ask the students regarding their satisfaction towards the online learning sessions. Also, we ask them to rate uh, the effectiveness of the learning sessions on their perspective. You can see on the figure on the right how the satisfaction level of the students decreases. You can see from IT to the architecture, the satisfaction level has decreased. From that, we can understand why IT arts and social sciences, which are more theory based and computer based, they have seen a higher level of satisfaction. And whereas the engineering, survey and architecture students, uh, for which the disciplines are uh, theory based, practical based, they like this, they have shown. Uh, sorry, not theory based, practical based, lab based, or design based, they have shown a less satisfaction towards the online learning sessions so far. With that, uh, I can come to my conclusion. Before coming to that, I can show you some genuine comments of the students. You can see one or two of them. Continuous online studies critically damage my mindset and I'm facing depression all the time. This is one of the genuine comments of the students. Or, uh, Again, there are many comments uh, given by the students. For example, some have given us many suggestions to do, recommendations, such as to give the students have to have, and have conversations among them. So with that, I can come to the uh, conclusion. Out of the three factors, the technological infrastructure, distance learning competencies and psychological concerns, and the field of study, you can see the biggest problem faced by the undergraduates in Sri Lanka is the access to the internet. At the same time, not having the satisfactory uh, technological devices is another problem that they have faced. Apart from that, according to the response of the students, we could see so far the e learning sessions have been mainly favorable for the few disciplines which are computer aided and theory based. The practical, lab based, and theory, uh, design based uh, modules, they are still trying to find an optimal learning approach. With that, I'm pleased to give, a, give some recommendations of the authors. First and foremost is the proper network connection. Of course, this is not in the hands of academia, but still, we have to make sure that equal opportunities are given to all our students. At the same time, we recommend that the ICT literacy of the students have to be improved. Considering about the general context of the learning sessions, we can say the lecture sessions shall be interactive as much as possible, and the participatory learning techniques has to be incorporated wherever possible. In order to do this, the technological advancements can be taken as a basis in, in order to uh, enhance the learner's experience. Another main recommendation that we would like to do is to limit the lecture sessions to smaller time slots and allowing the student to engage more in self studies. But we should make sure that proper guidance and proper materials should be given to the students in order for them to attentively engage in self studies. Another recommendation that we would like to give is to concern on the psychological condition of the students. No matter but if we use the advanced technology, no matter we used the highest uh, possible and the most efficient teaching technique, it would still not be effective if the student is not in a proper psychological condition. So in the time of this, we should definitely consider about the psychological conditions of the students. So we recommend uh, to initiate proper counseling schedules and systems in every faculty, every department. And as academics, we recommend all to always check upon the psychological condition of your student. Finally, but the most important recommendation of our study is to adhere to the TPAC framework. The TPAC framework indicates the technological, pedagogical, and computer framework, which indicates not having the advanced technology is sufficient for a proper learning experience to the students. It has to be combined with the content knowledge or the curriculum based on the subject knowledge, along with the pedagogical knowledge or the teaching techniques. Once all these two are combined together, the experience of the learner will be enhanced and will be able to give a final output to the students because at the end, it is the student that matters the most. So with that recommendation, I'm going to wind up my study. If anybody is interested, there are some references. And before winding up, I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, my co-author and my supervisor, Mr. Banush Kavikarasimhu, and all the staff of the Faculty of Health and Mental Spatial Sciences for their guidance in the study. Also for the undergraduates who willingly participated for the data collection survey, and all the other indi uh, individuals who helped us to make this event a success. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Chairman, <coughs> and it's a very timely uh, topic. 
I want to make a small clarification from you. I don't know because there's one English language teaching in it, uh, lecture also involved there. Uh, it's a mitigate in the effects or effects, EOA. I don't know that, that you have to clarify, right? You mean the EOA? Uh, so we hope that that is the effects of EOAs. Right, okay. Right. So leaving that one, I think uh, uh, this e-learning system we are discussing mostly in this platform. I think three, four presenters have uh, already presented this uh, uh, e-learning uh, and online uh, delivery methods. My personal thing, not I have not conducted any research. The the to make a real professional, we need the personal interaction. That's very important because that is how we can give them certain uh, right. Uh, inspiration about the lecturers and uh, the group behaviors and even uh, teamwork, right? So uh, I think in isolation, some of these aspects are really missing, right? So e-learning in a way, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, make a man alone without any uh, surrounding for him to grow, right? So this is uh, uh, something like we are growing something in a pot and in the ground, right? So that's something for you to think about. Right. While uh, concluding from there, uh, we'll go to the question and answer session where uh, right, you can raise any concerns, uh, right, any questions, uh, maybe comments, uh, whatever from the presenters. I'll first leave the opportunity to the panel members who are already there and doing a tremendous job. So over to you panel members if you want to make any clarifications, any questions. Uh, it's open up now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, my question goes to uh, the first presenter, Mr. Disanayaka, on machine learning and algorithms, which is again very smart. And uh, what kind of uh, methodical limitations you encounter during your study? Well, uh... The limitations mean uh, there are such limitations like uh, uh, the uh, technological limitations. First one is the technological, and the second one is the lack of knowledge about uh, the about the drones technology, and uh, and the third one can be the the cost problems. I think. In, oh, okay. If I'm right. Oh. Uh, this Sanayaka, now uh, you were concentrating on uh, one of the important aspects, which is smog detection, that you uh, yes, uh, uh, considered uh, some uh, total discometer area and you yes. did test and uh, validated with your technological tools. So, uh, other than that, what did you do? Yes. Yes, this alg this uh, specific of algorithm can detect uh, the hard hats of the construction personnel, and uh, the fire detection and also can be uh, detected. So, well, how did we, you it? How did you test it? You went to a real life uh, uh, sort of a, a project uh, going on. Yes, sir. Uh, I okay. I did a case study in the Colombo area. Uh, uh, in a construction site, uh, uh, I can uh, tell about the fire detection accuracy if you want. How I did uh, that? Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this selected area also has uh, that uh, 200 square meter uh, mm -hmm. area, and the mm -hmm. drone uh, we sent uh, uh, to that area and uh, flew on a straight line, holding 10 meters of latitude from the 14th floor of the building. So uh -huh. there were ten tests. Uh -huh. Ten tests were carried out to carried out with a maximum of, uh, six fire points and a minimum of uh, zero. So we gathered the numbers uh, shown on that chart I showed on the presentation, and also you can see that in the article. And we did the F score calculations. So that's a one one type of F, F score calculation, and there were three F score calculations. Finally, we took the uh, mean value for uh, get the uh, final results. Any similar research uh, carried out of this type in a local context so far? Uh, 
not in local context uh, but the internationally uh, they did some uh, researches but uh, they are not related to construction so some are in uh, like uh, they they built uh, uh, algorithms to uh, detect uh, 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 some some i think uh, okay how long did it uh, take you to complete the whole thing uh actually for that uh, th there were three tests i i mentioned that for three tests we i be doing uh, using uh, two days so test consume two days but the uh, other part of the research is uh, consumes about uh, two actually two or three months to complete that Okay, thank you, uh, Dusanayaka. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Dusanayaka, I have one question. How long yes. will it take to give an alert? It means, sir, uh, uh, say something is happened, something happened there, and then how long will it take to give the alert? Uh, yes, sir. The alert sending mechanism, I uh, mentioned that it, it, is, it is still in uh, development condition. So uh -huh. the the uh, drone and the hazard detection system works completely automatically, but this is uh, in, this is in the development stage. The uh, we need a person to communicate with uh, the with the safety officer. So uh, in future, I plan to send alerts to a smartwatch that can whereby a safety officer when he's in on the site, so he can get uh, alerts from the ground station easily. Okay, and also if there is a barrier. If there is a barrier, something like that, then uh, it's quite difficult, no? Uh, then you take the video, say, uh, say uh, another another site, uh, yes. they are also uh, releasing small, right? Uh, then, uh, uh, no, so the that uh, that our drone only fly. Uh, specific waypoints which we send to the drone so it will not uh, get uh, alerts from other sites uh -huh. okay thank you thank you sir uh, one question have we done a feasibility as to whether it's feasible to be uh, used in construction industry in sri lanka so can you repeat the question i didn't get that sorry yeah have you done a feasibility analysis on whether it is possible to be used in Sri Lanka? Uh, I never undergone a study on that. So, uh, I did a, I just a case study to how it, how this works on my research. All right. Have you studied the cost element uh, that is there? For mm. this yes. Uh, in here, I used a pre-assembled drone. So it has a flight controller called uh, Pixhawk. And the and it has GPS model and a camera. So uh, nearly it uh, takes forty five thousand to assemble this, and we need a good computer with a uh, GPU processing power. So and the softwares that I uh, run on this com uh, this algorithm are all are in open source. So basically, this can uh, this system can be developed under one point five lakhs. Okay. So okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, This is uh, to the plan or Are you online? Yes, 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 I'm online. So you, uh, I mean, main, uh, I mean, when you go through the conclusions, I found that according to my understanding, your main uh, uh, findings are actually uh, the, the court commissioners are not, uh, the, 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 the surveys are not undertaking the court commission cases because of the reason that low rates and uh, late payment, am I right? Uh, no, th there are some other uh, main problem is uh, the court 
commissions, large number of court commissions are there and the act doesn't provide enough provisions for them to do that actually. One thing is uh, delay of payment. The other thing is when they do the partition, they have to defend it at the middle of court with the participation of several lawyers and judges. Mm -hmm. And they have to comply with planning regulations in the field as well as legal conditions at the court. The survey is very difficult to defend these two at the at one time at the court. Oh, Just fine. because of that, I think that this is unwanted, unwanted responsibility. Then. As a freelancer, any person compelled to keep away from that kind of thing. And the payment is some other thing. And the nature of argument at the court is some other thing. They doesn't feel that they are a specialized person to assist the judge. The way they are interrogated by the uh, lawyers responsible. No, my understanding is if you are to be paid well, all this can be undertaken, no? I mean, maybe if you establish a, a certain payment code or something, let's say defining something in the courts and whatever the, uh, what is called, uh, defending the method of that you have undertaken the job, everything is fine. If you made a payment structure, which we, we are, we can, uh, the service can spend time and some time and uh, afford to do it, right? Yes, yes, yes. Very in a particular professional surveyor, yeah. he cannot survive on that. He is yeah. uh, survive on freelance practicing while practicing like that involving with the court commission. Yeah. But court commission, large number of court commissions are there. It's a burning issue. Mr. Ranavaka, I have a question for you. Are all these things a research outcomes? Because you came up with a lot of uh, recommendations, series of recommendations, having detected the engines out of which the delay is uh, more crucial than any other factor. But then, uh, how did you derive all these recommendations? Yeah, this is a matter of land administration, actually. Where the land administration eventually uh, related with the government matter. But when we uh, consider the private land, it's rely on the these uh, uh, survey professionals and court proceedings. Therefore, participation of the survey professional is very crucial for uh, quick completion of these uh, matters, uh, court cases. If not, they will remain stuck at the court. Sorry, what I'm asking is, are, are all these uh statements yeah really the research outcome of your own research yes we have your given, experience no, no no we have given 73 questions for the opinion survey as well as 22 questions with direct answers with the help of that two type of questions i derived that uh, conclusions what's your response rate Pardon? Your response rate out of 72 or how many, how many were participated actually? Actually, uh, in the two provinces, we uh, participated 233, nearly 233 uh, Responded professionals. To mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 online. To the Google survey. Okay. Any questions from the... Uh, Mr. Anamaka, I have one question. Uh, what yeah. can you say about, uh, actually, government was introduced uh, that uh, title registration program, uh, BIMSAVIA program, to solve yeah. some land disputes in our country. So, yeah. uh, what can you say about that uh, again? Like, yeah, yeah. The BIMSAVIA is a, uh, one kind of attempt to... Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, before go to the court, they try yeah. to solve the situation. Yeah, they try to solve the problem with two yeah, uh, yeah. consolation bodies. Oh, reconciliation body, right. Yes, yes, but yes. Uh, there are uh, considerable amount of cases yes, sir. The, that uh, uh, 
reconciliation team cannot solve. At that time, uh, they have to separate that plot of land with co-ownerships and they have to go to the court and get solution. Yeah. The problem is 70-80% of private lands are urban lands mm. which are having enormous development potentials. Yeah. And stuck at the court more than 5 years, 10 years. Mm. Nobody concerned it. Sometimes 20-30 years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. That is why I wanted to highlight as a survey professional, as a survey community, and we also, are focused. I feel that um, the payment is not a problem for surveyors. I think that act and also there are some regulations should be changed. According to my knowledge, that means uh, uh, payment is uh, it is uh, that, that means uh, as a to practice as a court commissioner, then uh, he or she must yeah. be a licensed surveyor. Or now we have registered yeah. surveyors, so then uh, then only you can you are eligible to practice in under the court. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. then uh, I think. Uh, Act should be act or some regulation should be changed. I think. Yeah, that is, that, that is the thing that uh, non-formal payment system mean. Uh, let's see some particular course, uh, court case have five or six parties. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, they are uh, settling their payment time to time. Mm -hmm. That payment span, span may be six months or one year sometimes. Yes. Not even that, some persons prevent from paying their mm -hmm. share. At that time, what is the court procedure is auction that part of land on public and recover the cost. Yes. Is it practical actually? It, it, is, it is practical long ago. But mm -hmm. nowadays, professionals are expecting their payment within a fair amount of time delay. But auction of that land and recovering payment is is very uh, time-consuming task. That is why they are not involving wholeheartedly with the court commission. But this is a matter of uh, this is a national issue regarding the private land administration. Okay, thank you. I think now we are quite clear about the issue. I think that is something we have to attend. Uh, I think. Uh, with a national scale and even all the relevant ministries, uh, officials has to attend to this one. It's a very serious issue, I hope. So we'll go into this. Uh, any other questions from the audience or from uh, Southern Campus? Uh, any undergraduates? Right. Uh, so one last question uh, from this uh, final presenter, Ms. J.M. Jaiman, is regarding the social sustainability. So you are trying to say that, uh, right, I mean, uh, mainly in your uh, whatever research, what I saw right from the beginning is uh, the attention given to uh, the environmental and uh, economic uh, sustainability is not uh, same way given to uh, social sustainability. In terms of uh, weight, let's say if you take, uh, for example, environmental, economic, and social sustainability uh, adding to a hundred percent, what is the social sustainability component on that front, if, according to your right thorough knowledge on the subject now? So, actually, that was done by the third presenter, Ms. Samaratna, not me, regarding yes. the social sustainability. Yes. Yeah, sorry, yes. I missed that. Yes. I think about 5% is given to the social sustainability. 5%? Yeah. Uh, the main thing uh, they focus on the environmental sustainability. About 75% mm -hmm. is uh, concerning about environmental sustainability, like sustainable materials, I do think. And through that, we can go to the economic, economical sustainability. Uh, very few uh, 
uh, has given to the social sustainability very few attention has given to the why why i have raised that question is actually i mean the reason that uh, i mean if it is a 5% right anyway when it comes to certain cases we give it up 10 15% no so can't we drop this social and sustainability in terms of entire assessment that is the final i mean if there is no impact on the uh, requirement uh, i i mean uh, doing something which is not really relevant that is what the question in, in terms of totality if it is only contributing to 5% so can't we give it up so that is what i raised that question no sir the social sustainability means the uh, fundamentally about people so the employees without the employees they are won't be construction industry so we have to focus on social sustainability in order to enhance the uh, efficiency of uh, construction industry so i uh, so according to the research uh, uh, we must focus uh, more attention towards social sustainability i accept the fact that the 5% or something is okay i know but we have to make sure in that research you have to establish that all these uh, whatever the social sustainability factors are linked to the environmental and economic sustainability so in that case it is much uh, influential and it has a much weight when it comes to the the entire uh, scope so that is what uh, we have to explore so that part of the story that is what i am saying uh, still not discovered right for example the environmental uh, aspect has certain part of the social part aspect and even uh, the the economic aspect is uh, overlapping with the social aspect so that if you establish that link you will realize it's not 5% that's what uh, my argument so that need to be more further research right yeah right thank you very much uh, any other questions uh, that you want to raise on the topic so we'll conclude uh, because the time frame is uh, 4:30 Thank you very much, uh, and I thank all the uh, presenters who has done a good job. And uh, there are so many interesting things, and we came across uh, sustainability, uh, online uh, teaching, and even drone technology, a uh, bit of uh, interesting areas, right? So thank you very much, and hope that you will be doing uh, right, a good job for the coming sessions also, and your contribution as a research. A researcher to the national scale is very important as i mentioned from the first uh, session so thank you very much and uh, hope that you will contribute to the national development by doing a practical and applicable research thank you So, the conclusion proceedings of the technical session will be decided at the 14th annual international research conference. The date of the environment and space sciences will suggest the time to be considered. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the chair and all the presenters for their valuable contributions. May the future be bright. And with this successful conclusion of the preliminary and technical sessions. At the fourteenth annual international research conference, we will talk about environment and space sciences of Jammu and Kashmir at the Delhi University. It is time to award the best research paper and the best press presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are waiting for the results. So please, uh, please wait for another.
revenues. So we are waiting for the election results. So we we'll see who will be the winner. <laughs> so anyway, uh, either you are going to be a winner or loser. It's a matter of contribute. I mean, you participate for these sort of a uh, right uh, presentations. It doesn't mean uh, your research. If you are to be a loser, if you are not getting any award or something, doesn't mean uh, you are not contributed, right? So research is actually not discovering the universe or any something uh, very, uh, what is called uh, innovation is not uh, overnight happening. It's gradual thing. Maybe somebody has taken the research into some level. You may be adding very little right into that. So that is your contribution. That may be real, right, interesting and real uh, important. So that part is, uh, right, you have to be, uh, right, what is called, say, satisfied, but you have contributed. Maybe from there onward, somebody will take the button and maybe adding a little to into that one. So it's a gradual uh, innovation. For example, as we all know, right, uh, these mobile phones, right, how those evolved. Now those are the, the life of most of the people now. Right? So how things are evolving. So it's not that, uh, I, I mean, overnight this uh, mobile phone, so digital technology has evolved. So they, the, the research itself, right? So there's one time where the mobile phones were, uh, I mean, all the key, keys were uh, narrowed down to a fingertip, right? But later they have realized by research, uh, I mean, it's need to be uh, user-friendly and uh, they have used uh, large buttons, right? So these are the things that are keep evolving, right? There, there's a research in But for example, if you take uh, the, the, the Microsoft Word, there are more than uh, 1,800 functions in the Word. But we are frequently using less than 20% of that one, bold, underlining, uh, right, whatever, that sort of things. But there are more than 1,800 functions. Have you ever thought about it? That is why every year they are doing the research and drop whatever the functions which are not useful and add in new functions which are more useful, right? So that is the technology, right? So that is what we have to do, right? So think about it. So you are people are very uh, right, good enough in doing research. I think uh, things are all right, right? So you can continue.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Having witnessed the successful completion of the plenary and the technical sessions of the International Research Conference 2021 of the Faculty of Built Environment and Spatial Sciences of the General Sir John Kotelawala Defense University, it is my privilege to deliver the vote of thanks as the Department Coordinator of the Department of Architecture of Faculty of Spatial Sciences built environment and special sciences. First and foremost, I would like to offer my heartfelt gratitude for the chairperson of the plenary session, Professor Samita Manavadu, and the plenary speakers, Dr. Ravihansa Chandra Tilaka, Chartered QS Professor Mrs. Kanchana Pereira, Professor N.P. Ratnayaka, and Professor Siegfried K. Yeboa, for having graciously accepted our invitation to attend this year's plenary session and for enlightening us with a greater intellectual discourse. I would also express my heartfelt gratitude to all the technical chairs, Dr. H.M.I. Prasanna, uh, Professor Mrs. Yasangita Sandhanayaka, Dr. Ravi Hansa Chandra Hilaka, and our panel of judges, Professor Chandana Jayala, Dr. P.G. R.N.I. Prasella, and Dr. Kasunam Gopala, and all the presenters for their valuable presence made today to make this event a success. I would extend our gratitude and appreciation to the Vice Chancellor of KDU, Major General Presa, Milind, uh, General William de Pilis, who bestowed us with his immense support to conduct this conference successfully. A special thank goes to Rector Sir, Major General Prasad Dediri Singha, for this conference would not be a reality without his constant guidance and encouragement. In addition, I extend my sincere thanks to the Deputy Dean of the FBSS, Commander Chintan Mana Singha, and his team, including all the squadron commanders and the military staff. I would also like to convey our sincere thanks to the conference chair, Dr. Harinder Vidanagi and his team, and uh, all the conference coordinators, department coordinators, faculty coordinators, assistant registrar of the Southern Campus, editors, comparing team, heads of the departments, and all the academia, military staff, other anchors, clerical staff, 
and academic and non-academic staff of the southern campus and the academic and non-academic staff of the civil engineering department of the uh, faculty of engineering kdu ratnalana and all the non-academic academic and non-academic staff of the kdu ratnalana and everyone who supported to make this event a success last but not least i would like to convey our sincere thanks and the appreciation to the dean of the faculty dr a h lakmal who acted as the backbone of this conference and whose tireless dedication made this event a success thank you very much sir looking forward to meet you all at the irc 2022 once again i would like to extend our deepest appreciation to everyone who contributed supported and participated to this event thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen the proceedings of the technical session are here by the leader please rise for the meeting anthem Yeah. 